Hey y'all, new day, new week, and I cannot wait to dig in for Matthew 2 as we continue our series forward. We're going to start off with Matthew 2 verses 1 through 13, so here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? They, uh, we observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on a pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him, Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah wrote it plainly. It's you, Bethlehem, in Judah's land, no longer bringing up the rear. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east, pretending to be as devout as they were. He got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star had appeared. Then he told them, about, uh, told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, Go. Find the child. Leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word, and I'll join you at once in worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. The star appeared again, the same star that they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. When they opened, then they opened their luggage and presented gifts. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Still a beautiful section of verse, because it is. <laughs> Sorry. In a dream, they were warned about not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. You know, I repeated that last bit, admittedly, not just because I had seen it again, but because it's kind of one of the four points that I actually want to kind of dig in. <laughs> I feel like that number might be a scant of Spanish Inquisition moment. So there are a couple of points that I wanted to share when I was digging into this and just playing with it with God and letting him learn me what was going on. The first thing he pointed out was that wisdom comes from the Lord and that the wise seek truth and honor him. And just it was so interesting that these magi, you know, different versions, magi, wise men, you know, some of them call it kings, but I love the band of scholars analogy because you have these people who are attributed with wisdom and the first thing they do is seek truth. The truth made flesh. The word made flesh. They seek to worship the Lord. And it was beautiful to me that with wisdom coming from the Lord, the, the truly wise seek Him perhaps not knowing that they're seeking him, but they still do nonetheless. Which wraps into Proverbs' idea of this, you know, wisdom personified. I really quite love digging into it. And as I was digging in further and looking through this, you know, word of inquiry got to Herod that he was terrified, and not Herod alone. And I was just like, wait, 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 why would they be terrified? And I realized, you know, because you would think the priests, the high scholars, all of these people would be glad to know that their Messiah is coming. So why would most of them respond with fear? And it made me start thinking about, okay, well, this is a city that's gone through the Maccabees revolt, seen Alexander the Great, seen more war than you can shake a stick at, really, and even to this day. But Herod himself, well, he's a puppet. He was instilled by Rome, if memory serves. So... If you've got a group of people who are basically in there because of another group, and most of the Jewish people, I mean, we see it even with the disciples, were expecting a Messiah that would rage a bloody war. So, 
you know, it could be terror at the idea of having Rome come down on Bethlehem, or sorry, on Jerusalem again. It could be fear of not wanting to lose one's power. But it's interesting to me, and it's something God pointed out, that wrong flees at the right presence. And not just, you know, people. There are some people who are just like, nope, can't be around the Ned Flanders, to use an idiom that's been said to me. At the same time, well, then I've said it, but it's interesting that certain behaviors will even flee in the right presence. When we walk with God and let him set the pace, bullies, whatever form they may take, usually end up dispersing. Not by anything we've done, but just because we're walking with and in the Lord. And so the very behaviors that he doesn't want and can't stand, behaviors that we shouldn't want and should not be able to stand, flee. Not because we're abusing the person, not because we're being a Bible thumper, not because we're doing any of that crap, but because we're walking with the Lord. His presence in us as we shine like the moon, reflecting his glory, reflecting his image, being made into what humans are supposed to be, following the example of the truly human one, Jesus. As we go through the Father to get to the Son, that intimate relationship, that presence in us, the Holy Spirit in us, changes the world. We're image bearers. And it's beautiful to me that when we stay in His presence, even though difficulty will rear up, I mean, Jesus himself said that it would. It's beautiful that we can be given a sense of peace about it. Because we know how the story ends. We know he wins. The beautiful curiosity for many of us is understanding that he won 2,000 years ago. It's like, okay, well, if he won then, then how is he winning now with the world being like this? Free will. We're the ones that have the choice to follow him. We're the ones who say, I want you as my king. I want to play by your set of rules, your set of standards. And he lays two out right there, most important. Love God with all of your might, all, or all of your mind, all of your purpose, all of your muchness, and love others as yourself. that beautiful opportunity to walk away from playing by the world's rules. That's how we're more than conquerors. Because the idea that wrong flees in the right presence, why are we picking up a sword? No. I mean, even if we did, it's clear that watching what happened with Peter, Jesus, and the priest servant in Gethsemane, Peter cut off his ear and Jesus put it right back on. So, we don't use the sword in the physical sense. We use the sword in the spiritual sense. Speaking verses over our lives, truth over our lives. Walking in trust. And as the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we dwell in Him and we are able to move forward, the evil will flee just because it can't be around Him. You know, it's, it's, to give an analogy for it, the sun, if it is, it, the sun, S-U-N, if it is not like the sun, it will go kaboom if you get close to it. Not because the sun is, you know, out of its way to harm anything, it's just deadly to that which is not it. Similar here. The Lord's presence outshines the enemy. When we dwell in that, when we hold to it, we can find peace. And that's digging into the truth and the wisdom of the Lord. Because all truth, all wisdom comes from Him. And He gave us His word. He'll learn us about it when we go to Him with open hearts. And as we dig with Him, and He is in us, darkness flees. You know, I started digging in more, too, about the idea of the Micah prophecy 
you know, because in most versions it doesn't actually say that it's Micah who says it. You know, you have to find the little footnote to go find that. <laughs> like, oh, it's Micah there. Five three, I think it is. But it's kind of interesting that the message version puts Micah right in there. So at least if you want to go find it, well, book of Micah. Here you go. It's a beautiful prophecy, though, and something I think really connects to what Jesus says with the disciples, you know, after his resurrection, where he goes through and explains the entire thing to him. Granted, I think he did that twice, maybe three times. But even this one, it's you, Bethlehem, in Judah's land, no longer bringing up the rear. From you will come the shepherd leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. Because not only are we getting the beauty that God is true to form, that he says, Matthew twenty sixteen. yeah, that the least shall be first and the first shall be last. You know, this, this idea of a different order of things. Because even Jesus' birth points to the very core idea that none, no one, is lesser in the eyes of God. We are all his creation. Now, we may not all be his children, but we're all his creation. And granted, the only way we can be his children is through the Son, through the blood of the Lamb. Through that deep relationship, that trust, accepting him as the Master and Savior. And I know I keep repeating this, but seriously, it's like... <laughs> Don't want to play by these rules? The world's rules, the kill each other, the backstab each other, the I'm going to betray you because you, you, you a tu brute day, a tu brute seems kind of dull to me. This, the word, that's what it's supposed to look like. I mean, knowing that we are all his creation, that no one is lesser in his eyes. Imagine if all of us lived like we truly believe that. Imagine if every human being understood that we are all made in his image. Black, white, tan, yellow, brown, puce, purple, polka-dotted, ivory, green, or tan. Gay, straight, trans, doesn't matter. None of it. We're made in his image. If there are things to work out, he will work them out in us as we dig in with him. I mean, there's a lot of places in the Bible where it where the it says shut up and trust, don't vitch, don't do the with a V, don't do the complaining, don't do the keep it singing the ba, trust. Because if we actually trusted God when He says that we're all made in His image, that we're all to love each other as we love ourselves we actually lived it, imagine how different it would be. And I really do believe in my heart that the difference between those who live it and those who believe, you know, who believe it, truly believe it, no low expectations crap, no none of that, just truly, we are all made in His image, worthy of respect and love. It requires Christ in you. You have to be God's child to understand what it is to love not just His children, but His creation. I firmly believe that. It's like, oh, well, it's, the plant's pretty. No, 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 no. I mean, enjoy the pure wonder of it. The what's next, Papa. That's the Holy Spirit in us. No, no, crap, what's next? But what's next? What bit of wonder? What bit of joy? And even if there's sorrow, though it may last all the night, it comes with the morning. How beautiful that we can hold to Him that He holds to us. How beautiful that nothing on heaven or on earth Nothing angelic or demonic, man, made or unmade, can separate us from Christ's love because of the way He loves us. And how beautiful that we get the opportunity 
to be in relationship with Him and learn and be learned what that kind of love means. You know? And it's digging it, just reading through, and it gave me such joy. <laughs> you know, to know that He's got us. That His way of doing it looks a little different. But He's in control. So why not enjoy a little different? You know? As, you know, I'll, I'll move to the last point with the, the gifts for just in just a moment. I just want to add this. If wrong and right are so dramatically different, why do we want to play a wrong way where we put other people down? And I don't mean calling out behavior. I mean cutting each other down. Hate doesn't need to be in the heart. Jesus himself says, if you hate your brother, you've already com your brother or sister, you've already committed murder in your heart. And it's the truth. You just have to extrapolate it across time. If you hate somebody enough that you want nothing to do with them, well, now they're always everywhere. Now I have to get rid of them. Suddenly hate becomes violence really damn quick. And... That's not right behavior. Murder is not okay. I'm, and I'm not quoting the Ten Commandments on this one. I'm just saying straight up, murder, not okay. Murder, never okay. So, why would we want that kind of spirit in our hearts? I didn't. I hope most of us don't. All of us don't, honestly. I would hope that none of us would want that kind of hate, that kind of pain, that kind of things in our heart. And the only way it's getting truly out is if God takes it out. We break upon Him our rock so that we can be made whole. Lest we be crushed underneath it. No. Last bit as I was digging through here was just the gifts. The gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And, you know, it, it kind of comes, it ties in with they were at the right place, they were at the right time. Because God will get you where you're supposed to be when He wants you to be there. One way or the other. I've found from my experience that arguing with Him is a bit more painful. But God will make it happen. You can't be late for God. He's always there waiting. You know? And that our King is waiting there for us is a beautiful thing. You know, I kind of, I, I know it's seemingly more five points, the, uh, or, uh, yeah, the five points of the gifts and then the getting there on time. Because God will get you there on time. And we're going to go into that a lot more next week as we finish up chapter 2. But God will get you there on time. God will get you where you're supposed to be. You can't be late for God. You know, a lot of us say, well, he has horrible timing. Mm, God has perfect timing. He just doesn't do things in our time. But God will get you there. God will get you there. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe fighting a battle that's already been won. You know, and I'm talking the physical here. Our hearts need to change. We need to welcome in the kind of love that is God. We've got to let it into our hearts. We've got to let it into our souls. Because the way we've got it going doesn't work. And digging into this bit of word, knowing that God's way of doing it, the last shall be first, the first shall be last, knowing that wrong flees at His right presence, knowing that true wisdom comes from Him, 
knowing that he gets us where we need to be, exactly where we need to be when we trust him. Suddenly it makes the dressing of lilies with beauty and splendor and the amount that he loves us that much more all the more beautiful. I can't wait to see you guys tomorrow for when, or sorry, not tomorrow, next week for finishing up the last of chapter two. Though it may be tomorrow, God tells me to. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> see you guys the next week at, bare, at the bare minimum. God bless. May his favor be upon you and know that you are loved. You are loved.